I want to welcome you all tonight to the forum to meet the candidates for state representative for the 1st Franklin District. I am Becky Shannon of the Northampton Area League of Women Voters, and I will be moderating this evening. The organizers and sponsors of this event are the Recorder, FCAT, and the League of Women Voters of Franklin County. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. FCAT, FCAT is recording this event live and will have it available for streaming on their website. Let's please give the organizers of this forum a round of applause for helping your community get to know these candidates. And thank you, audience, for attending and uh, to the audience at home that will be watching. The first Franklin includes Ashfield, Buckland, Conway, Deerfield, Leverett, Montague, Shelburne, Shutesbury, Sunderland, and Waitley. The primary election is on September 4th, a very busy time. It's the day after Labor Day, so mark your calendars now and become well informed this summer. Remember that the winner of this primary on September 4th will be your new representative as there is no opposing candidate in the November election. Our panelists tonight are George Forsair of The Recorder and Nicole Moore from the League of Women Voters. Nicole will be asking questions on behalf of the audience. Our candidates tonight are Kate Albright Hanna, Natalie Blaze, Christine Doctor, Jonathan Edwards, Casey Peace, and Nathaniel Waring, and France, Francia Wisniewski. We thank the candidates and the panelists for participating in tonight's forum. Thank you. Nicole's questions will be from the audience, as I mentioned. So we hope that you will write down a question on the index cards that are provided. It is important that all questions be addressed to all the candidates. When you're done, raise the card above your head and a league representative will pick it up. A league panel will quickly review the questions, perhaps combining similar questions and choosing questions that allow for the greatest range of topics. And those questions will be passed along to Nicole. As moderator of this forum, I'm going to try and move through the questions as rapidly as we can so that we are able to have the most number of questions asked and responded to. Because of the number of candidates tonight, there will be no opening statements. We will jump right into the questions. Note that not all candidates will answer all the same questions. Candidates will be given 90 seconds to answer each question. In order to be fair, it is critically important that candidates adhere to the amount of time allowed for each answer. When you have 30 seconds left, a timekeeper in the front row, right in front, um, will hold up a sign. Likewise, when you have 15 seconds left and at the end of your 90 seconds, it's, and you see the stop sign, wrap it up. <laughs> The forum will conclude with a two-minute closing statement from each candidate. Now, before we begin, please note where the exits are in the room, and please take a moment to examine your cell phone to make sure it's turned off or in airplane mode, and turn off any other noisemakers. So check those phones. I, I better check my own. And lastly, please do not clap after a candidate's statement. We will have a hearty round of applause for the candidates at the end of the evening. Thank you. So, let's get to the questions. The candidates have drawn straws to determine who begins. The first question will be asked by George. 
and answered by Francia, followed by Jonathan, Kate, and lastly by Natalie. So I will remind everyone as we go through. And thank you, George. OK. Um, can you hear me well enough? Was that a yes? Yes. All right, good. So we're going to jump right in with a softball question, all right? And I don't think if applause is allowed, boos are probably not allowed either. Uh, OK, so the question is, uh, what is it about your level of relevant experience that makes you the best candidate to be an effective legislator from this rural part of the state uh, that historically has been outvoted by the predominantly urban interests and sensibilities uh, of eastern and central Massachusetts, right? So here we are in little old podunk western mass and how are you going to go up against those tough urban guys? Thank you. So investing in their products, um, local cooperatives, that is critical. I think, um, as I, again, I say in my past forum, as a person that has an accent, Winston Mass also is like that person that always struggled to be her in the part of the state. So I will ensure that we are her um, with my skills. Um, also, as a person who lives here and talk to neighbors and talk in anti-poverty agencies and talk to farmers and own a business, I do know that I'm able to, to bring all of this experience together to be able to connect uh, with uh, legislators. Um, I am a networker. I am a person who understand um, the families here from the, um, from the community and the ground up. Thank you. Jonathan. As a 14-year member of my Waitley Select Board, uh, I've been successful because I'm a coalition builder. If nothing else, in my 14 years, I have been successful in, coll in creating collaborations that have helped further the, need, the solutions to the needs of the people of South Franklin County and the rest of the, of, of the First Franklin District. We can only succeed in Boston when we work together. As someone who's built coalitions to create the South County Emergency Management Service with Sunderland and Deerfield, as someone who's been the chair of the Board of Oversight for the South County Senior Center, as someone who's the president of the Frontier Calrican Youth Baseball League, all organizations that can only succeed through collaborative efforts, it's in my nature to find the collaborations necessary to move the ball forward. As the next state representative, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected, I will do that in Boston. With every issue, I will look to find the coalition of individuals, the coalition of my new colleagues who can move the ball forward, who can find common ground and find solutions to the issues that we all care so deeply about here in Western Massachusetts. It's not about giving up your passion. It's not about giving up the, the things that you firmly believe in. It's finding commonalities. It's understanding the needs of other regions to, to, to listen and learn so you can build those relationships and that's what I bring to the table here. Again, I know the needs of this region because as the president of the Franklin County Select Board Association for five of the past six years, I've worked with towns across the district to ensure that I understand their needs. Please there are select board members up, in this please. room who I've worked with and I will do the same thing as your state Thank representative. You. Kate. So I'm originally from Texas and my grandparents were ranchers, but it was a very red state and it didn't match my values, so I got out as soon as I could. I went to college. Um, I uh, worked in the Jimmy Carter uh, Presidential Center. I worked in the Clinton administration and I ended up working in the Obama administration. Um, I am the only candidate who's been endorsed by a sitting state representative, Eric Lesser. Um, uh, in Massachusetts, and I understand how to navigate the corridors of power, but I also, as somebody who has had uh, an award-winning career in journalism, understand how to hold power accountable. Um, 
So what's important to me right now is that I bring together all of the experiences I have and put them to work. Um, I've co-founded an organization called Rural Organizing. It's a national organization um, that is trying to turn red states blue. And I believe that Massachusetts, um, the rural community that we have here, can be a model for the rest of the nation. Um, I'm running because uh, the chair of our select board in Huntington uh, and the treasurer came to me and asked me if I would be willing to run. Um, they are Republicans, um, but, and they know that I am as pretty far left as you can get, but they know that I'm their neighbor, uh, and they trust that I will do what's best for our region. Um, so, again, I have a history of being able to straddle both worlds, but not compromising my values. Thank you. Natalie. So I'm Natalie Blay, and, and I've been working for you already for over a decade. I grew up in uh, northeastern Vermont where we like to say that, well, I think there are more cows than people. Uh, we had one yellow blinking light. So I know what it means to come from a rural area, and it's why my family chose to live here in western Massachusetts, specifically in Sunderland. And when we moved to Sunderland, I decided to get involved with local government. I got onto the Library Board of Trustees. I, I love local libraries. I know that here in Deerfield, you're looking to get a new library, and I would like to help facilitate that. But for me, working for Congressman John Olver, who's, who's up here, if you haven't seen him yet, say hello. Uh, I worked alongside many of you on many of the projects that you have been trying to move forward throughout the years. I've worked alongside your farmers. I worked uh, with Tom and Becky and Ben and Lori Clark when there was a pipeline that was proposed to go through their, their orchard. I was here when Tropical Storm Irene hit and walked through the fields with Chip and Sandy Williams to get them the assistance that they need. I have worked with you to get roadways and bridges built. I have worked to bring rail service back to the Pioneer Valley and hit our major centers and it goes right through Deerfield. I'd like to see maybe a stop here one day. Uh, but I look forward to working, to continuing to work alongside you and to work collaboratively with you. We need to form a voting block of Western Massachusetts legislators to make sure our voices are heard in Boston. Thank you. Now we'll hear uh, an audience question from Nicole and it will go to Christine, Nathaniel, and Casey. Good evening. Considering how things stand at the federal level, what will you do to protect the rights of Massachusetts residents with disabilities in case the ADA falls? So I'm Christine Doctor, and I'm originally from Peru, Massachusetts, but now I live in Cummington, Massachusetts on a sheep farm, a third generation family sheep farm. And I went to Columbia Law School where I graduated with honors. And then I went on to become a trial attorney. And my practice was split between complex commercial litigation and public interest pro bono legal work. And in my pro bono practice, I took it upon myself to represent historically discriminated groups and marginalized populations of people. I worked for New York lawyers from the public interest, and they work specifically on disability law issues. And in my time there, I learned a lot about the ADA and about enforcement practices. And what we're facing right now with our current presidential administration is the total breakdown of the protection of our constitutional rights and freedoms. So I'm very glad that I have a background in civil, constitutional, human, and women's rights because we need those protections now more than ever. And so we need it for people with disabilities, American with disabilities, and something that I think we should really push forward if there is a failure of the ADA on the federal level is to push it through on the municipal level. Towns can do a lot to protect their populations. They can do a lot legally, working with their, with their council and working as communities to make sure that we still have access, to make sure we still have services, transportation, jobs, and many other services that the ADA provides on the federal level we can bring that using the 10th Amendment to the Constitution states' rights to our towns directly. Thank you. Nothing. Thank you. The failure of our federal government started long before Trump. Uh, it started when the legislature uh, stopped working together and started fighting with each other and stopped passing actual legislation. Uh, and a big part of that is due to Citizens United, and also a big part of that goes back to uh, when uh, Fox News was basically given the green light to lie uh, and call it news. Um, so fixing the problems at the federal level is something, 
that we can do here at the state level. Uh, and in effect, what's going to happen is the republics are going to get exactly what they want, which is states are going to become stronger and the federal government is going to become weaker. Um, but we have an opportunity to use that to get real legislation passed here in Massachusetts uh, and be a beacon for other states to model their legislation after ours. Uh, we also need to be looking to uh, pass constitutional amendments to fix the federal government. The federal government will not fix itself. Uh, it, it's too addicted to the money. It will not fix itself. Uh, but we can pass a overturning of Citizens United here in Massachusetts, and if enough states also pass that, it becomes constitutional. Thank you very much. Casey. Thank you. Uh, my name is Casey Pease. I am a volunteer firefighter and emergency medical responder in the town of Worthington. And what we're seeing happen from the Trump administration, and I'm sure a lot of you can agree, is unacceptable. And as a result, Massachusetts and other states are really going to have to pick up the slack uh, where we're seeing a rollback in, in policy, where we're seeing a rollback in regulations, whether it's with the ADA, whether it's with uh, environmental regulations and what have you. Being in a progressive state, which I would say can do a lot more, I think we, we are in good hands. Um, but that being said, we're going to have to be able to do more. Um, I'm also a community organizer. I was one of the youngest staffers on the Bernie Sanders campaign. And what I think is incredibly important in these tumultuous times is that all of us have to be paying attention, have to be organized. Because it's one thing for a member of the state legislature, for your state representative to be pushing for legislation. But it's a whole other thing when you have the entire community behind you putting the pressure where it is needed to ensure that happens. It's why I'm encouraging more young people to get involved in the political process. And when it comes to something specific like, specifically like this, it's why we need people who are going to be more bold, who are going to be more progressive, and challenge the Trump administration. Thank you. So George will ask the next question, and the order of responses will be Natalie, Francia, Nathaniel, and Kate. Uh, well, let me, I, I guess, attempt to follow up my last question. Uh, with the retirement of Steve Kulik, and other Western Mass legislators, the death of Peter Kokot, the resignation of, of Stan Rosenberg, uh, Western Mass uh, is going to need to rebuild um, its delegation in terms of experience and clout. Uh, so the question becomes, if you get elected, um, why would, well, let me rephrase that, why would you be the candidate who's going to most effectively rebuild our clout um, in, in the legislature, and how quickly can you do that? <laughs> well, I'd get started on day one. Let's put that right out there. Uh, I, John Seidbach has, has made the comment that we are losing 100 years of collective experience with the retirements of the folks that you've just mentioned, 100 years. Our delegation worked together extremely well Stan was great on transportation. Steve was great on agricultural issues. John Seibach was great on, on disabilities. And they worked collaboratively to ensure that our voices were heard in Boston. The fact of the matter is that Boston has just as many state representatives as we do in all of Western Massachusetts. So we have to work together to form a voting block. And we have to support one another. And I think that my existing relationships that I have with the legislators in Western Massachusetts would allow me to slip into this role seamlessly, to be able to fill Steve Kulik's very large shoes, uh, and also work with our state senators. Adam Hines has been an incredible leader. Uh, he also was a former John Oliver staffer, I would like to mention. Uh, and he was able to, to hit the ground running when he started. I would like to do that as well. And my very first thing that I would fight for is for a pathway to get onto the Ways and Means Committee. We need someone from Western Massachusetts fighting to bring resources back here to make sure that your roadways and your bridges are funded, that we have affordable housing, that we have installation of renewable energy technology, and that we are supporting our local communities. So that would be my first priority, getting into Boston. Francia. Thank you. 
So when I go to along this community, I hear often, wow, this race is very crowded. How are you guys gonna separate each other? You know, we have, we're losing legacy. And what I say to people, our race actually should look normal. This is the way democracy should look everywhere. I'm excited about this moment that people like us who represent a diverse part of the community are here. Um, I'm thankful for Representative Kulik for his work. I know him for many years because as an advocate for many instances in the community, I was able to um, know of his policies and he also, um, and we needed to collaborate to have the best. I cannot imagine a Commonwealth without um, collaboration. I'm confident that when we, whoever wins here in the State House is gonna be a person who will step for support. Um, I'm also excited that um, you know, people here in the Commonwealth um, have an opportunity to elect um, a woman of color like me because um, when we are able to bring representation forward, I'm not just a woman of color, I'm a person with 17 years of experience working in the community, who was elected twice in office, who understand policy, who has written education policies at the state level that brought race to the top funding to this community, so benefited of the school systems. Because I have been an advocate, I have relationships with people, and I will be continue to represent with experience and strength. Thank you. Uh, the short answer is I wouldn't. Uh, I actually consider the experience equals clout in Boston to be one of the biggest problems that we have in the Commonwealth. Um, I don't think that you should have to wait until your ninth term to be important, or even your second or third term. Uh, we don't get fresh, young, new voices because you don't get to say anything for your first year, your first two years, your first three years. Um, all you do is vote. Uh, and so one of the, the things I don't think it's a problem that we're losing 100 years of experience. What we're using is 100 years of people who have been doing the same thing for the last 30 years. Um, I'm looking forward to changing things. I'm looking forward to getting in there and really mixing up how politics work in the Commonwealth because in a lot of ways they don't. For me, the question it, it really comes down to, do you think that things have been going well in the Commonwealth for the last 30 years? Uh, for many people, that has. But for many more people, things are not going well in the Commonwealth. Uh, there is a lot of poverty in the Commonwealth. Uh, the housing in the Commonwealth is exceedingly expensive and it makes it very hard for people to live. Uh, and so what we need to do is we need to have representation in Boston that has experience, but not the kind of experience that you think that, that they want to have, but the experience of living at the poverty level, the experience of living on Section 8, on mass health. Uh, this is experience that many people in this, district, in this state live with on a daily basis, uh, and yet if you look at the legislature, there are no one on that legislature that share that common experience. Thank you. Kate, we need to be honest, the House is dysfunctional. Um, it lacks transparency. Um, it couldn't get some basic things that are a matter of life or death for our towns across the finish line, like funding the education bill, uh, passing the Safe Communities Act, which should be a no-brainer in a state that has the legacy of uh, civil rights that we have in Massachusetts. Um, I've already started reaching out to um, the other people who are running across Western Massachusetts, and we've been talking um, about what is possible if we are a united delegation and what we can get through if we have a common voice that we can carry to Boston and tell them what's going on in our district. Um, one thing that I would like to do is uh, form a single pair caucus as soon as I get into the House. I believe that health care is the number one priority. It's a crisis that is um, reaching its boiling po point and we need a solution. Thank you. Now we'll hear from an audience question and the order of responses will be Kate, Christine, and Jonathan. As you may know, a developer is seeking to build a huge Dollar General store in Deerfield, and residents here fear that, if approved, this box store would signal the end of Deerfield as we know it. Dollar General has plans to build huge stores every five or six miles, so although this is Deerfield's issue today, all other First Franklin district towns will be facing the issue soon. As our next elected representative, what would you do to give our local communities more control over development and more power to stand up to large corporations seeking to build unwanted box stores? 
So when I joined the planning board in Huntington, I found out that we didn't have a site plan review, that anybody could come in and do what's happening here in Deerfield, which is open a dollar general store uh, without any community input. Um, I passed a 12-page site plan review law um, just recently and feel that we have at least a foundation for having more control over our local economy. Um, that's really why I'm in this race, because I believe in a strong local economy. I believe, about, I believe in keeping wealth inside the district and uh, sharing it among our neighbors. Um, so I feel very strongly um, that we can use the tools um, on the local level, on the town level, but also a state representative. Um, I will use every tool within my power to make sure that we empower our local business owners, uh, would-be entrepreneurs, anybody who has ever thought about starting a business, and make sure that they have um, a head start over the large corporations that want to come in from out of town and suck our wealth out into some other um, offshore account. Christine. I feel for Deerfield. This is also a problem right now in my town in Cummington. I'm a board member of the Old Creamery Co-op, which is a very small institution over in the hill towns. Uh, we're a co-op grocery. We support hundreds and hundreds of local farms and local craftsmen and artisans. We're a huge community center. In these small towns where we don't have many other gathering places, places like a little small general store, a place where you can get a cup of coffee or lunch, are extremely important. I also do special counsel legal work for our town, and they've brought me in to consult on what's happening with the potential dollar general in our, in our town. And I've been following what's happening in, in Deerfield as well. We're trying to keep tabs and perhaps join forces a bit to help each other out. Um, there are a few issues that, that have come up, and the first is we have old bylaws. We need to look at our town bylaws and make sure that they're really protecting what we need to protect. Do we want to protect the character of the town? Do, are we looking at jobs? You know, what, what is at stake and what are the issues? And how can our bylaws address that so that we don't have to face this as an emergency and put in stopgap solutions? Um, we can also put in things like bonding issues, such that if big businesses do move in, then when they inevitably move out, they don't leave kind of environmental disaster behind. In Cummington, the Dollar General is looking to build right up against a wetland. And so it's a big issue for our Conservation Commission as well. And it will be when these are built every you know, two to five miles. Um, but something we're trying very hard to be sensitive about is that it's becoming class warfare. We have to be very sensitive to the fact that there are some people who want jobs and um, cheap goods and services. So we have to look at our food system, we have to look at our employment system to try to address these things so that they don't become a problem with big institutions like this. Jonathan. Town self-determination is critically important. As someone who's been on my select board for 14 years and is currently going through a quite contentious uh, <laughs> issue regarding adult entertainment, town self-determination is critical. And too often it's lacking. The best policy to make sure that we can self-determine in a town is to make sure that we create the right coalitions among our committees. Making sure that the ZBA and zoning and CONCOM and the select board and other stakeholder committees communicate on a regular basis. Far too often in town government, you have these important critical committees operating in their individual silos. And what happens when they, when they operate in their individual silos is you have dysfunctionality in government. And I'm not saying that Waitley is exempt from that dysfunctionality because, because sometimes every town has it. But what you learn with the experience is knowing who to put in a room so that we can identify the type of town that we want to have and that we have forums and we have community involvement and public hearings so that it's amplified the type of town that you want to have. While some towns may want a Dollar General store, other towns will not want a Dollar General store. But it has to be a conversation. Also, there needs to be much better awareness among people who want to develop what the town processes and policies are on any type of development. That, that kind of communication is critical. Thank you. You. So now we'll go to George, and the order will be Casey, Natalie, Christine, and Nathaniel. Okay, let's talk energy. Um, 
the legislature just wrapped up uh, its most recent session without achieving the kind of energy bill that clean energy advocates had wished for. Um, it didn't do away with net metering caps. Um, it didn't appreciably grow the renewable portfolio standards uh, to meet the state's long-term objectives for uh, cutting carbon emissions and, and uh, trying to re sort of re restart the momentum toward uh, renewable energy uh, industry like solar. So the question becomes, what would be your top priorities for a future energy bill uh, specifically? Um, and how would you convince your fellow House members to vote your way? Yeah, so this, this is an incredibly important question, especially for our district. So as a young person, I am extremely concerned about the rate of CO2 and methane emissions in our atmosphere. We have to have been bold. We have to be bold now, but we had to have been bold 10 years ago. Um, and so part of the solution is yes, we need to absolutely ensure we're putting the, the pressure and passing the legislation to transition uh, to renewable energy. But we also have to understand that renewable energy alone is not going to solve our problem. Um, we have to look at what can we do here in the first Franklin district. Well, in the first Franklin district, we have a lot of agriculture. And there is a way to actually get carbon out of the atmosphere and put it in our soil uh, so that not only do we have uh, healthier soil, but we are in fact doing that. So, so the priorities I would have would be to push for legislation that would allow for that. And then the big question is, well, how do you get the folks from Boston to sign on board? Well, we have the most beautiful and fertile land in the world. And it's time to use our leverage against Boston and say, hey, we, have, we grow so much food here. Do you want to partake in that? Well, here's how. And there, there has been ways that Steve Kulik, um, the late uh, Representative Cocott, has done that by actually bringing our produce and what we make here to the State House, build those relationships, and say, here, you know, this is how I can help you in Greater yes. Boston if you sign on to our legislation here for Western Massachusetts that's Thank going to make you. people healthier, healthier and our environment healthier. Natalie. So I, I'm concerned about the way that the process worked and the fact that everything was rammed through at the last minute. There was not a lot of public input. It feels like we are being left out of this process. And when that happens, the people who have access, the special interest groups, get in in those final hours and we end up with what we did. The Senate bill, the omnibus bill, had teeth. The House bill did not. And we ended up with much more of the House bill than I would like to see, but it gives me an opportunity to get going the day that I get to Boston. And for me, my biggest concern is transportation emissions. Transportation emissions now account for 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions into our atmosphere in Massachusetts. If I were elected, I would absolutely institute carbon pricing. If we are taxing the carbon, we are generating revenue that we are then able to put back into people's pockets and to put back into investments in clean energy transportation, energy efficient, uh, well, clean energy vehicles, buses, into public transportation, into trains, uh, and really, and bike paths, you know, really forging those connections. But we need that revenue and we need to absolutely cut down those transportation emissions if we are serious about fighting climate change. Christine. It, it really is a shame about the energy bill because we are getting close to, if not already past, the point of no return. I'm sure many of you saw the, the New York Times Magazine special recently that said, we had a chance to save ourselves from climate change a few decades past, and we blew by it. So we have to take this seriously, and this has to be our number one priority. And I would seek a seat on the Joint Committee for the Environment, Agriculture, and Natural Resources, if elected. Um, I'm a farmer, and I've seen the effects of climate change right here in Western Mass, even on our farm. We've had drought, 
We had a tornado in Cummington. Uh, we've had terrible storms. There are issues throughout the district right now. And you remember Hurricane Sandy, as well, Hurricane Irene as well. And we have to get on this while we still have a chance. We have to explain to Boston that this is working land. We produce food, but our forests are also working. Every single tree is helping to clean the air, to clean the water, to clean our soil. We really have to think of this land as working. And we have to make sure that towns are adequately comp compensated for land that's in conservation, such as the payment in lieu of taxes program, so that towns can continue to afford to have conservation land. And so that farmers like, like myself and other farmers in the district don't have to sell off our land to developers. Because the first week we moved into our farm, we had developers coming to us. So we need to focus also on reducing fossil fuels and conservation. With a million new people on the planet Thank every you. four days, let's focus on that. Thank you. Nathaniel. More carbon emissions come out of the tanker ship or the massive cargo ships that bring our goods across the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean than all the automobiles in America. Um, people like to look at the small problems while ignoring the huge, massive ones. Um, industry is by far the biggest threat to the environment. Uh, and yet, when we're talking about environmental things, it's talking about how can we do things publicly? How can we do things as private citizens? How can we do things as individuals or as the, the government? When the question should be, how can we force the corporations to do what they should have been doing all along, which is looking at the cost of the environment when they're looking at their own costs and factoring that in. If I'm ordering something from across the seas, there's a carbon cost to that. If I get it from local sources, there's no cost there. Um, and so, as legislatures, what we can do is we can keep those, um, keep the pressure on the corporations and the uh, industry that's causing all of these problems, uh, and, and just force them to, uh, you know, through your carbon taxes or through um, incentives for green companies, co force them to uh, change their practices. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we'll have an audience question, and the order will be Jonathan, Francia, and Natalie. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> what are your thoughts for economic development? Please be specific beyond extending internet broadband to all in our district. <laughs> I'm sorry, what are your thoughts? I'm sorry, repeat the question? Sure thing. What are your thoughts for economic development? Please be specific beyond extending internet broadband to all in our district. Western Massachusetts has largely been forgotten with economic development in this state. Uh, we are not as fortunate as the rest of the state when it comes to the fruits of the current economic growth that, uh, that, that the, last, the last five, six, seven years after the Great Recession has, has, has taken place. I recently called for a per the permanent position of Assistant Secretary for Economic Development for Western Massachusetts. We need someone who wakes up every morning in the administration thinking about nothing but job growth, good, high-paying jobs in this region. How do we get rural Massachusetts on the economic train that the rest of the state is, is, is realizing? We also are seeing jobs lost because of, uh, because of our lack of vision in our clean energy uh, policy across the state. The solar industry alone has lost 20% of its jobs over the past year because we lack vision in this state for clean energy. My approach would be to create uh, strong skill growth so that advanced manufacturing, clean tech, and, and the innovation economy th thrive and, and are fostered with creative solutions so that we can build an economy to make Western Massachusetts continuously the greatest place to live, work, and play in this state. Thank you. So as my family own a business, we already are part of the economic development. I have seen firsthand how having an, um, a business that um, try to be part of the growth in the community and start building the, the community alone too. So, and I'm trying to see this issue in perspective because 
I remember that, you know, I have been a person who's been earning $8 per hour, and that, was, that has been the common of many families. And I will ask a, de a developer or any business owner, will you invest in this town that lacks infrastructure or lacks um, support or support from the community? Um, recently, I was talking in the Hilltowns with the Hilltown CDC executive director, and we were changing and, and saying how difficult it is to have business thriving because there is no ways of transportation. For our community especially, we don't have weekend transportation. How are we going to go to work? Um, Access to um, internet, I know is broadband, but when we have people who don't have access even to medical portals, you know, we, we need to ensure that we provide infrastructure. Single payers healthcare, if we provide that for people, we will have more funding. Our children will have more funding for education because the local municipalities will be able to increase and enhance um, their funding. Right now, we're paying lots of money locally for health insurance, um, thank you. <laughs> Natalie. So as many of you know, I'm currently the executive director of the Franklin County Chamber of Commerce, where our mission is to improve the civic and economic vitality of our region. We consist of approximately 400 businesses, nonprofits, and, and small businesses, including farms. We have a number of farms uh, that are members of the chamber. And I'm very concerned about our rural economy. We saw it last week at Yankee Candle, who laid off 16 workers. As soon as I heard that that was happening, I reached out to my friend Patricia Cosby at the Franklin Hampshire Reb to say, we need to be conscious about what's happening at Yankee Candle and make sure that we are prepared to offer those employees the services that they need to get retrained, to get any uh, employment benefits that they, they may need or deserve, and make sure that we are finding them other employment. That is the first call that I made. Now, as the executive director of the Franklin County Chamber of Commerce, I am on something called Freddy which is the Franklin Regional Economic Development Initiative. That's the CDC, it's Greenfield Community College, it's the REB, it's the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. And together we have decided to work on the problem of our aging demographic uh, that is also declining and how we are going to address that and bring jobs to the region. And I have made a huge push to work on outdoor recreation as a way that we can fuel jobs and also improve the health of our local students. If we're able to get students involved in the outdoors, then they're becoming healthier and they're supporting our local businesses. But my job is to bring people in from outside of the area to support these local businesses across the entire county. Thank you. Now George will ask Nathaniel, Kate, Casey, and Francia. Okay, on to education. Um, and speaking of the, the last legislative session and how wonderfully it didn't, uh, the House failed to take up education reform bill this session. Um, seems like education is always one of the key issues that candidates like you like to talk about, at least in general terms. Uh, what are your top priorities for education funding change um, and how will you make sure those priorities get addressed? Thank you for the question. Uh, it still boggles my mind that with a uh, large surplus this year in the state that we haven't seen a huge funneling of money into our schools. Um, I also uh, think it's ridiculous that there hasn't been um, a, a, a tying of the uh, legal marijuana sales directly to uh, school funding. Um, these are new sources of revenue that need to be bundled into the right places. Um, the real question ends up being, what do we care the most about in the Commonwealth? Um, the last question was about economic development, and really what that's about is business interests, small businesses, large businesses, but business interests. It's not about empl employee interests, it's not about citizen interests, it's about you know, how, are, how's, how's the economy doing from the top down? And I'm much more concerned with how it's doing from the bottom up. Um, and the, the, the biggest problem that educators have uh, is having children show up in the morning hungry or tired because their parents got home from work at 11 o'clock at night and they wanted to stay up because that was the only time this week they got to see them. Uh, if we empower the poorest among us, uh, we lighten the load on teachers, uh, and by doing that, we make the whole experience better for everybody. Thank you. 
So we know that we have this one to two billion dollar deficit um, because healthcare costs keep going up. Uh, we have set infrastructure costs, um, and yet we're being asked to do more with less. Um, our towns are at a breaking point, and it's unconscionable that the legislature failed to pass an education funding bill. Um, we need to put school transportation reimbursement into the foundation budget so it's not subject to appropriation by legislatures and legislators in the East who don't seem to really understand uh, how critical it is, every dollar for us out here in the West. Um, and we need to end charter schools. Um, they're taking money out of our public system. And um, uh, you can either be private or public, but we shouldn't be giving our taxpayer dollars to a private system. That's not held to the same standards as our public schools. Thank you. Casey. Yeah, so it is absolutely unacceptable that leadership was unable to get a bill passed in reforming our Chapter 70 funding formula. And their excuse was, well, we need some more time to examine some of these policy uh, goals. And I concur with Senator Sang, uh, Chang Diaz, who's been pushing for these uh, reforms for years now. Three years ago, I testified to that Joint Committee on Education and on behalf of First Franklin District Schools. I explained to them that out here, we have higher costs for regional transportation that was supposed to be reimbursed in 1949, and that hasn't happened in the past three decades. And so, there, all across this commonwealth, whether you live in a rural district or you live in an urban district, people, teachers, parents, students, everyone can agree that there are reforms needed to Chapter 70. And that's where we really have to put pressure on leadership. And I might add that this Saturday, uh, Speaker DeLeo will be the longest serving uh, Speaker of the House in Massachusetts history. I want that to be the last of the longest serving Speaker of the House in Massachusetts history. If you cannot support our students, our schools, our teachers, I say goodbye. Please let's refrain from clapping. <laughs> um, let's see, Francia. So education is a strong suit, I'm a and a teacher, my degree is in biology and chemistry. I have taught students, I have taught classrooms of 44 students, and I know exactly what it means to be assinated in a small room. I want to ensure that as a legislator, I will continue working in the efforts I already have been working on. One, universal quality preschool for all. When we have quality early childhood education, parents can go to work and can go at peace. And this is also a matter of social justice. The early, the brain develops in the early years, birth to three. So these are the, the foundation, birth to three, are critical for our education system. Um, second, transportation. When I was a school board member, I, that's one of the main issues that we have. And we still have not resolved how we're gonna bring transportation in a way that's fair and that doesn't result to laying off teachers because we don't have enough funding to transport children. Third, special education is my main priority. Children deserve a chance to have life, achieve, life achievement and school success too. So I will continue working hard for special education programs and farm to table. Our children need to have the right to have access to healthy cafeterias. So those will be my key priorities that will be implemented as your legislator. Last week, I'm, I was ashamed to hear chapter, chapter 70 school funding reform didn't pass and we need to change that now. Thank you. Thank you. Nicole from the audience and Christine, Jonathan and Natalie. What is your plan to restore the viability of public education in the Hilltowns given the loss of children, families, and the closing of our schools? I grew up in Peru, Mass, which is a very small town that borders on our district to the west. And when I was growing up there, my sister went to our really amazing one-room schoolhouse where she thrived. And then the school was shut down for financial reasons. Fast forward 35 years, Frank and I moved back to take over his family farm. We're so excited to send our kids to Cummington's local school where he attended as a kid. And then the school was shut down for financial reasons. 
So I've seen up close and personal twice now what happens when we fail to provide adequate funding for our schools. And it's not just a failure to our children. We're failing to give them proper education, but we're also failing the communities. These communities get broken up when a school closes. Kids who would otherwise know each other, ride a bus together, who are neighbors, are now going to schools wherever they can choice in, wherever it's closest, or wherever the parents are able to take them. And, and that's a real problem. Also, a town loses a lot when we lose a school. We lose jobs. We lose the ability to attract young families. If you can't attract young families, you can't support young businesses. Or even former businesses, a lot shut down when you lose a school. So we need to make education funding a priority, and not just asking our towns to pay 70% of their town budget on education, but fixing it at the state level. And from there, we need to make sure our schools are absolutely excellent. Thank you. I recently called for the state to fully fund uh, special education costs. Fully fund 100% of, of special education costs. We are deficit spending. We're, we're not spending over $1 billion a year that should be spent on special education. The state needs to take responsibility for those most in need. When the state does that, it will open up over $1 billion annually to go towards other mainstream educational needs, allowing us to hire more teachers, allowing us to perhaps preserve schools in communities. When a school closes in a town, that town lacks the ability to attract new young families to that, to that town. Those families will go somewhere else. The state needs to pick up the tab for health care benefits as well so that towns can focus on funding the ed education part of, of what they're supposed to do. But also we need to focus on the core problems with, with how, we, how we fund our, our education through, through town, town budgets. We need job growth. We need a place to live, work, and play. We need further recreation so that young families want to come back here, so that we increase our revenue streams. We have young people moving to the area, so you can't close a school because we're a vibrant community. We're a vibrant community when schools exist. We lack that vibrancy when schools don't exist. So job and economic growth would be a key part of what I, what I would do. Natalie. So I mentioned before that our demographics are shifting and we are seeing our population decline and it's, it is getting older. And as a result of that decline, our tax base is also declining. And also as a result of having an older uh, citizenry, we don't have as many kids in our local schools, which is, is why we are having to close down many of them. So my work now and something that I would continue to work on is to bring families back to the region. If you grew up here and you moved away or you went to college and you've established a family somewhere else, how can we bring you back home? How can we allow you to enjoy the spectacular quality of life that we have to offer in this entire 19 town area and fuel our local economy, have your children in our schools, increase our tax base. We need those young people and we also need them because we need people on our boards in our local communities. Uh, I was talking, I think the question was specifically about the hill towns and, and I met with uh, the Southern Hill Town Collaborative with Jean and one of the things that we were talking about was the empty space that we have in schools. What if we use some of that space for maker space that brought the community and our students together so that they were colliding and sharing ideas so that the next time they ran into each other in the grocery store, they knew who each other, uh, who they were, because we're losing those connections as our schools are closing, and we absolutely have to be connected in our communities. Thank you, George. Uh, and the order will be Francia, Nathaniel, Kate, and Casey. Um, okay, well this question is, uh, I guess, designed to, to learn a little about you and someone else on the panel. So the question is, can you ask a pointed question of one of your fellow candidates? <laughs> well, actually, it, it should be, would you ask a pointed question of one of your fellow candidates? Do we get to answer? <laughs> so this, is, this is where we learn something about you. Sure. 
I just will ask my fellow candidates. No, just, um, you need to pick one. Oh, a fellow candidate. Oh my gosh. <laughs> sure. We love you, Francia. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Let's start with you. <laughs> Um, so, I know we have a conversation um, a while ago, Natalie, and I, I, you know, we were talking about public education systems, and I was mentioning to you, I was eager to hear your positions on public education systems, and, you know, like, I have been a person who have been a product of public education and have chosen that for my family and my children, and I would like to hear your instances, how you will be your policies and your support for public education systems and your choices um, as well for the Commonwealth. Yeah, thank you. So I feel, so the Chapter 70 funding formula absolutely has to be fixed. And thankfully, we've had a real leader in Senator Adam Hines. He has been spectacular. And I would hope on the House side to be able to work alongside him uh, to make sure that that continues to move because we were left hanging at the end of this session, and that is a problem. But again, that failure allows us to hit the ground running because we know exactly what we have to work on from the very first day that we get there. I do think that we need to put a, ch a cap on charter schools. And if we are going to continue to have those charter schools, we need to develop a separate funding source. We cannot allow charter schools to continue to suck the funds out of our local schools uh, while, while we're really struggling. We need to help our teachers succeed and to support our teachers, and I so appreciate what, what you've done because I could never be a teacher. <laughs> I just could never do it, and so I so appreciate your, your work. And so I thank you for that question. Thank you. Nathaniel, your question. All righty. Um, my question is for John. Um, if you get elected, who's going to run the Cal Ripken Baseball League? Because. <laughs> Seriously, this is a big deal for me. Um, no, but in all seriousness, um, my question for you, John, is uh, do you feel that the economy over the last 20 years has been working well for the average uh, citizen of, of Massachusetts? Um, and within that context, what do you think needs to be done to make it better for everybody? Thank you. My heart bleeds for the Frontier Cowboys and Youth Baseball <laughs> League after I leave, Nathaniel. Uh, uh, you know, economic development is near and dear to my heart. And over the past 20 years, I actually don't think that the economy has worked for the majority of people. Um, this region got hurt more than other regions in the Great Recession, and it has not rebounded just like to, to the extent that other regions have rebounded after the Great Recession. We have seen the wage gap increasingly grow and grow and grow with no, with, with no change in sight. One of the things that I do professionally is I work in Springfield to create economic vibrancy for people in the, IT, in the IT field. Women of color, men of color, people on the at-risk populations all need a sustainable career, and I'm very proud of the fact that workforce skill, the, bridging the workforce skills gap through, through programs like Tech Foundry offers is a way to bridge the, fun, the, 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 the income gap that we've seen. So no, it hasn't. Um, worked for everybody, and it needs to start working for everybody, especially in urban areas and in rural small towns. Thank you. Kate, what is your question? All right, my question's for Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> One time, see you tonight. <laughs> uh, what is your position on the Mohawk Trail Woodlands Partnership, biomass, and the method by which it was pushed through the legislature mm -hmm. in the recent session? Mm -hmm. Well, I have the legislation right here. <laughs> <laughs> so this was, uh, this Mohawk Trail Woodlands Partnership uh, was, there were a number of public hearings throughout the course of the last couple of years. Uh, I believe there were over 50 public hearings that brought our communities together to, to talk about how to f help our local communities preserve land because we can't continue to rely on the federal government to provide the funding that we need to continue to protect our local agricultural land. Um, so this was included in the environmental bond bill. Uh, it does include a number of the provisions that you know, a number of people were concerned about, including that no funding received or expended by the partnership shall be used for construction or operation of wood pellet or biomass. 
and that no funds can be appropriated through this legislation for U.S. government and its agency, the U.S. Forest Service, to hold a fee interest in any property in the Mohawk Trail Women's Partnership. So it's clear to me that there were a number of concerns that were raised in this process, that they were heard, that they were implemented into the legislation, and that our job as legislators is to make sure that the legislation is now followed, that the process is open and transparent, and that we do allow people to come to the table, offer suggestions, and work to a common solution. And I am against large-scale biomass. Casey. I think that was it. All right. Um, so I asked this question, of course, with utmost respect to my opponent, um, but my question is for Kate. Uh, and my question is, how do you um, yourself feel you can best represent um, the 1st Franklin District, which is one of the most rural districts uh, in this state, uh, when you re recently, very, very, very recently moved here from New York City? <laughs> Casey's signs are that he's homegrown, bold, <laughs> progressive. Yeah, and we're the neighbors. isn't just marijuana. We're in a sign war in our neighborhood right now. Um, yep, I moved here uh, from New York City, and before that, let's see, Chicago, D.C., Atlanta, and Dallas. Um, I have lived uh, 43 years almost, and uh, I have been in a lot of different situations, talking to a lot of different people, um, and I could have lived anywhere, um, but I found this place, and I think it's amazing. The question earlier was about um, economic development, and frankly, our 19 towns are the most adorable, like, picturesque place in the entire country, I think. Um, so I am uh, excited to live here. Um, I feel like I've been adopted by my town of Huntington. That's why they came to me and asked me to run, because they were... Um, they saw the, the work I put into the planning board, and my husband joined the school committee, and we're raising um, our sons uh, in the school system, and I just feel incredibly fortunate to live here now. Thank you. So we move on to another audience question, and it will be Christine, Jonathan, and Kate. What steps could a freshman rep take to increase the availability of housing and housing support for senior citizens? As an example, uh, the present wait is eight to nine years. That wait's really a problem. I experienced it uh, in my own family when I was 16 years old and my grandmother got sick with breast cancer was no longer able to stay in her own home. So my mom and I sought out uh, senior housing in Dalton, Massachusetts, and there was a two-year wait list. We were able to get her in, uh, but just a month before she then had to move in with me and my mom. And my mom and I had some tough times after my parents got divorced when I was nine. We had to move uh, three times in, in six years to find affordable housing in our area. And I recently hired a staff member on my campaign who was facing the issue of how to find affordable housing. She ended up moving in with us, which has been a strange experience, um, but has really brought to my attention that this is, is a really primary issue, and it's hurting jobs, and it's hurting seniors. So I think that we have to put more funding into senior housing. But even more importantly, we have to do what we can to help seniors age in place. Um, all of my parents, uh, and Frank's parents, and our step-parents are all in the district or immediately around the district. And they don't, they don't want to move. Uh, they don't want to be cloistered in senior housing. They still want to be in their homes, in the community they've chosen. So we need to find a way to help make their houses secure for them, safe for them, uh, environmentally sustainable. And when we're building senior housing, we need to be supporting organizations like the Hilltown CDC and their efforts to put in Hilltown and other housing for seniors that's environmentally friendly. Thank you, Jonathan. I think a partner question to that is, where is the housing existing? We need ho affordable housing plans for low-income individuals and seniors that actually put the housing on bus routes. We put the housing near essential services like post offices and banks and grocery stores. Right now in rural Massachusetts, we don't have a solution to where our affordable housing is because of the rural nature of our region. But if a senior is no longer able to drive, we need to increase public transportation so that they can actually 
live where they have spent their lives, have access to, um, to, to essential services. I chair the Board of Oversight for the South County Senior Center, which is a regional partnership between uh, Deerfield, Waitley, and Sunderland to make sure that seniors have a healthy and vibrant place to go on a regular basis for, for a good meal and, and access through public transportation. But that needs to continue beyond a senior housing location, I'm sorry, a senior center to senior housing. One of the things that we're doing in Waitley right now, working with the Frontier Regional School System, is to make plots, a plot of, two plots of land in Waitley available for low income and senior housing and make sure that a bus route goes past there more than once a day so that when people move in there, they can have a vibrant place to, to, to live and, and grow old with dignity. Thank you, and Kate. Um, so we're supposed to provide um, at least our 10% affordable housing. We're not there, and yet 30 to 40% um, of people in our district are low to moderate income. Um, we, that's a gap that's, again, unacceptable. Why, why aren't we covering the needs? These are basic human rights for everyone. Um, I was talking to a community of people in Whaley uh, who talked about how everybody on their block is um, around the same age and they're all aging together and they're getting together to talk about how they create a village um, where they can um, share resources uh, and stay together and, and keep the community that they have. And I think that is a beautiful idea and it's something that we should probably scale up. Um, you know, why are we gonna treat people like they're, you know, commodities to be moved into different housing when they reach a certain age? I think that um, for mental health reasons, for um, all sorts of reasons, we should um, allow people to age in place with their friends and their neighbors and their families if possible. Um, in terms of just big picture, I'm a big fan of supportive housing um, for people who um, are, uh, you know, have precarious living conditions, who are um, homeless um, and have other um, problems. Um, supportive housing is a scientifically recognized um, solution where we provide not only housing, but we provide all the services in place so that they don't use the more expensive services like hospitals and prisons. Um, that currently don't serve them. Thank you. George, uh, you're next. And Natalie, Francia, and Christine, and Casey. OK. Um, so we've established you're all in favor of lots of things. Um, <laughs> so if I can channel some of the more conservative people who might be living among us, I guess the question might be, um, have you ever seen a program or a tax you would like to cut? A what? A program or tax. Cut. Natalie, you're first. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think of a program or a tax I would like to cut. I guess I, I'm, I'm trying to think of, I, I would prefer to implement a progressive tax is what I would be looking at doing because I think that right now, you know, with the we didn't pass the millionaires tax, we need additional revenue. We absolutely need additional revenue because we're all talking about funding all of these programs and people are saying, well, where's the money coming from? And there is no more money. Right now, there is no more money. So if we're talking about funding all of these programs, we need additional revenue. And so I'm talking about getting on the Ways and Means Committee because if we're gonna have the same revenue, I wanna be at the table so I can make decisions about how we're spending that money so we can talk about what we're cutting and what we're not cutting. But I also think that we do need that progressive tax so that we are bringing in additional funding to fuel our economy. I also think with you know, carbon taxing and bringing in some additional uh, funding in that way that would fund transportation projects that we would be able to reinvest some of the funds that would have been spent on transportation on areas like education so that we can make sure that we are fully funding these wish lists. I mean, we are talking about wish lists of projects, but we have to be fiscally responsible. And if we are not generating revenue, then we need to be talking about how we are cutting programs and taxes. And I would want to be at the table to Thank be making you. those decisions. Thank you. 
So as a school board member, I have to be always making decisions with my colleagues about how can we convince uh, a local municipality to fund schools, and we were just one part of the formula. We always needed better libraries, more teachers, and more services. And when you have to also fund a police department, firefighting, and all other services, it, it becomes very difficult um, to find the ground to cut a special tax. So, you know, I, I asked this question at, at the beginning of the campaign trail to my elected officials, and the answer was, well, we want to tax the millionaires. <laughs> and that was a, a part of the campaign for a long time, right? So if this question passed, we're going to be in a good shape. All of this made me realize that we have very deficient systems of it all because we need to implement taxes that are um, progressive for Massachusetts. We are still benefiting corporations to, to profit and leaving the, the poor working class as the philanthropist of, <laughs> of our system because with their minimum wages, they're paying more and the people who make more are paying less. So I say we need to fix the system and my values are values that will pay attention to this, um, to this way of bringing taxation that's fair, that's understandable and that will include everybody um, in the decision making. Thank you. Christine. I actually have seen some taxes that I would like to see cut uh, all across the United States, and one is a big women's issue. I'd like to see no tax on tampons and women's <laughs> products. <laughs> uh, you know, this is really a, a gender tax, and there are a lot of other taxes out there on products that, when you look at the facts, they're really a, a, just a tax on being poor. So we have to take a look at what products are being taxed and, and think about that in a smart way and in a social justice way. Um, I also I saw a program that I, I would consider cutting. Um, I saw there was legislation promoting that the Community Preservation Act, monies from it, be used to support market rate housing. I think we need to funnel all that money into to low income housing and not in, into market rate housing. So I think that's another issue and that, that comes to social justice as well. Um, something else that really concerns me is that 37% of our state budget is spent on mass health. And the health outcomes are very mixed. You hear some people have a good experience with it, but a lot of people don't. So I would like to move towards Medicare for all. I don't think that our health or our pocketbooks can continue to wait on this issue any longer. We need single-payer health care. I've lived in Denmark and I've lived in France, and they have two different systems of socialized health care, and both were really effective, low administration, low overhead costs, and we could benefit, improve health outcomes, and cut down on the money we're spending if we move for Medicare for all. Thank you. Casey. All right. Conservatives, open your ears. All right. So I was just recently talking with uh, the chair of the Gateway Education Committee, um, and she was explaining how, at least in particular for Gateway, there were a number of schools that had been shut down and closed. And those buildings have now been repurposed as town halls and other community centers. And so one thing I would like to see is for the Mass Housing Authority to actually forgive the costs that now Gateway has, and the Gateway towns, they have to pay back uh, the money that was, you know, that was uh, granted to Gateway to build those schools. Forgive those costs. Another thing, um, we spend way too much money in Massachusetts and in our country in general on incarceration. Let's stop incarcerating people. Uh, you know, especially for, for minor offenses like marijuana possession. How much money do you think we spend on incarcerating people who are not, you know, getting, quote, rehabilitated, but instead, instead are, are facing all kinds of mental health issues and what have you in prison, and the fact that it costs so much money, and private prisons are, are profiting from that. So I say that there are a lot of things that we can cut. There's a lot of ways that we can be smart with our money. But at the end of the day, too, I'm going to echo some of my opponents here, we do have to move towards progressive taxation. Stop putting the burden of society on low-income individuals, on the middle class, and ensure that the wealthy are actually paying their fair share. Um, Nicole, uh, 
something from the audience, and we'll have Kate, Natalie, and Nathaniel. Do you support residents being Airbnb hosts? And please explain your answers. Hmm. I mean, I feel like the answer might be different in an urban setting, but I believe that in our rural area, I feel like it's probably okay that people Airbnb their, their homes and their barns. Um, I guess I should uh, think that through more. As a member of the planning board, it hasn't come up yet. Um, but yeah, my instinct is that that should probably be okay. So I'll have to look into it. Natalie. So I convened a group of hotels, uh, bed and breakfast owners, to talk about how Airbnbs are impacting their businesses because they are being impacted. And part of the problem is that they are not governed in the same, Airbnbs don't have to go through all of the same processes that a hotel or a bed and breakfast has to go through. So if you're staying in an Airbnb, it might not be up to the, the fire code, the, the local safety codes. They're not inspected. They're not. Uh, they're not taxed at the same rate. None of none of the. There's not a level playing field, and so our local bed and breakfasts and hotels are saying we're fine with Airbnbs being in our community, but we we just need to be on a level playing field. And so that's something that that I was certainly trying to advocate for, and is currently being considered and debated. Uh, in the legislature, the governor sent back uh, some uh, a request for a change, and that's currently being looked at. Um, but it, it is becoming a problem in our area, particular because we don't have a lot of accommodations. <laughs> so if we want to bring people to the area, where are they staying? And some of those Airbnbs provide some very unique experiences, but we do need to make sure that they're safe. I, I, would, I just hate to think of what would happen if something, if there was a fire or anything. And the other thing that I've heard of is in different communities that Airbnbs are taking over whole towns. And what happens when Airbnbs take over the whole towns and you have people moving in out of your community all the time, not serving on boards, not being present? So that's something I'm concerned about for our smaller communities. This question is a hard one, uh, especially coming from a perspective of somebody whose wife works as an Uber driver, which is basically kissing cousins with Airbnb. Um, these are, these are online organizations that allow um, regular people to do what pr normally licensed professionals do. Um, and it's great, but there's also not regulation. And there have been many days and weeks where uh, Uber drivers do not make minimum wage and there's no protections for them. There's no benefits for them, things like that. Um, and the same thing goes with uh, Airbnb is that there, as my opponent said, there is no regulation when it comes to these Airbnbs. They are not um, regulated the way they should be. They're not um, guaranteed to be safe. And on the same end is that as a host of an Airbnb, um, they are often left footing a, a large repair bill if something gets broken because, again, the, the site is not backing them uh, in that way. Um, but really the big question and the big concern here is that we live in a world where everybody needs a quote-unquote side hustle in order to get by. Um, everyone should not have to be raising additional funds through airbnb and Ubering. Um, one of my wife's coworkers that she's gotten to know is a police officer who Ubers because he literally does not make enough money to support his family. Uh, and that's a fairly well-paid profession. So that asks you, that means ask you a question of what does the rest of us have to do to make it? Thank you. So our next question is from George from The Recorder. And it's Casey, Francia, and Jonathan. Um, do you think that voters by referendum or the legislature by law should tell hospitals how to do their staffing? Ooh, this is a good question. Um, <laughs> I, I come from a family of nurses. Um, my mother is a very proud union nurse and she's been working really hard on the bargaining committee at Berkshire Medical Center. And what's kind of happened um, in our hospitals now, whether it's Bay State Franklin Medical, Berkshire Medical, uh, Bay State and Springfield, is that the hospital administration and the hospital administration executives uh, are getting paid seven-figure salaries. And they're going back to the nurses and they're saying, well, no, we can't adequately, adequately staff our hospitals. Uh, it's an insult to nurses. It's an insult to patients. 
and it's an insult to our communities. You should be not be making over a million dollars a year and then say we don't have the funds uh, to adequately staff our hospitals. To the question, I will be voting yes on one in November. Um, all the, that we're seeing the pushback on, on yes on one is coming from the money from these executives saying, oh, well, we can't afford to do this. We can do this. We have to do this. And I'm very passionate about it because I hear the stories all the time from my mother who is caring for patients, who's overloaded with the number of patients that she has to deal with. And she gets, the reason she's a nurse is because she wants to care and help people. And it breaks her heart when that level of care isn't able to be reciprocated because she has so many patients that she has to deal with while her boss is making $1.5 million. Thank you, Francia. Um, nurses are my neighbors, my running friends, my community. I birthed two children at Bay State at Franklin in Greenfield. And my husband and I had a birth plan and we have a seamless care from nurses that have my life in their hands. And the nurses made sure that we were taken care of. In many other instances with family members and relatives, um, I trust the nurses. I trust that they are say they need patient safety. That is something that we have to support and get behind. Um, especially, you know, we right now know that perhaps what we have to work is to be helping negotiate in fair contracts, good wages. I have stand in the picket line with the nurses, not just this time that are running for office, at least three different years fighting for their contracts. I will always will be standing with the nurses and the workers because I know that they are on the grounds working with people. Um, I also know that um, this is a, a big issue from um, in the, I have uh, my sister-in-law is a, a, a nurse in the VA in Leeds and also say we need um, better staffing for the veterans. So I will support nurses. I, I think that we, we can vote to get behind our, our care and always expect that when we go to a hospital, we're gonna have the best care and not just being left in a bed, waiting until somebody comes tired from working many shifts. Thank you. If hospitals are going to accept public dollars in the form of Medicare, Medicaid, and, 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 other, and other benefits, then we need to, as a society, make sure that we provide the best possible health care to patients. And if nurses are so overworked that they cannot possibly provide that quality health care, then our dollars that are going to support those hospitals are being ill-spent. So nurses need, and nurses are at the front lines of a quality health care. When I was in the hospital recently for a hip replacement surgery, I saw the doctor, you know, for 15 minutes. I saw nurses constantly. And if the nurse wasn't available because she had, he or she had too many people to care for, that was unconscionable, and that means that we have a broken system. So we need to give nurses the ability to, to discuss what their capacity is. They're the professionals. The administrators are not the professionals. And so if we're, if we're going to spend our money wisely, listen to the people who know their professions best. Thank you. An audience question now, and we'll go to Nathaniel, Casey, and Francia. What are your ideas for getting voters 18 to 30 years old not only registered, but especially into the voting booths. What are you doing to implement these ideas? Um, this is the largest growing voter block in the country. Um, as of right now, there are more millennials than baby boomers out there of voting age. Um, we need to energize those uh, as a oldest end of that millennial uh, range. Um, most of my uh, friends and, and relatives of my age feel jaded by the system, feel like their voice doesn't actually matter. And so the biggest thing we need to do is we need to give uh, the young people hope that their voice will actually be heard. Um, but more than that, we also need to fix uh, our election dates. Having our primary on September 4th is a joke. Uh, having, having it the day after the, the long weekend, um, my school goes back into session that day. Uh, a whole bunch of college students are coming back the days before, the days after. 
Um, and we need to create a system um, that uses better dates for elections uh, and also um, automatic voter registration. We need to have um, you know, absentee ballots pushed more. Um, by the way, you can absentee ballot now, so if you aren't gonna be around in the fourth, please do. Thank you very much. I'm next, right? Yes. Okay, just I'm making sick. sure. <laughs> um, so this is actually an issue that I am, am so, so passionate about, especially as a young person. Um, I'm really lucky because my grandmother was the first woman ever elected on the Worthington Select Board, and she served for 25 years. And so when I was a really little guy, you know, she'd bring me to town meeting. She got me involved. And so when I was a little guy, I'd ask everybody, are you voting? Are you voting? And they're like, why is this kid asking me this question? So I take pride in the fact that I've continued to go back to our local schools and community colleges, encouraging and showing young people that you have a voice, that you have a vote, it matters, here's how you use it. So how we get past the apathy too, yeah, we have to make, we have to make it so it's easier. We have to have same day voter registration we have to make it so that these arbitrary rules about absentee ballots that well, you have to prove that you're actually not going to be around. I mean, are you kidding me? If I want to vote from my house, then I can vote from my house through a mail-in absentee ballot. But we, again, have to inspire the young people of our country to get involved in the democratic process. That not only does your, your vote and your voice matter, but your participation in this process is how we're going to get past things like climate change, is how we're going to get money out of politics. And so I will pursue every way I can in the legislature, and I would also, if I get elected, create a youth council for this office at all of our local schools so that young people feel that they have a voice and that it's being heard. Thanks, yeah. So I'm very proud right now that in my campaign, I have young fellows working for it. And that was purposefully. I want them to see what it is, what is the meaning to run campaigns. I want them to be engaged. Um, some of them you might hear in your phone messages. Um, they are working in phone bank and very simple acts. But we have deep conversations about engaging with citizens in the Commonwealth. I was 18 when I cast my first vote for my president, and one of the things that, um, it, I was in a system that ensured that elections were held on Sundays. Right now, when we have elections during the week time and the working people, it's difficult, and I will echo what Casey said about making sure we support same-day voting registration programs. Um, I also have the privilege to join 10% off of my tuition of a public university when I voted. So this was a great incentive, and I would like that we one time should be able to see that this is a way to engage um, students and young people. I'm a commissioner on the status of women and girls, and through that, we are, I'm also making efforts to engage young girls into our system um, in public service. And I also, um, when I continue to support, I have two teenage sons, and we have deep conversations. Um, students should be able to be motivated to save in the local school, uh, school boards. I questioned my school board when we didn't have students representing, and their voice, their voice needed to be heard. Thank you. George, um, and the order will be Jonathan, Kate, Natalie, and Christine. Okay, I'm going to channel uh, someone from the audience now, because we seem to be accumulating some of their questions still, and we're running out of time. Um, this person sounds like an old college roommate of mine. Uh, name three things you've accomplished for the district in whatever capacity you want to discuss. Three things in the future or three, three things in the past? Three things you have accomplished for the district. Have accomplished in the so, district. So not as a legislator, obviously, but just as a person living here and doing stuff. Okay. Um, at, at the risk of repeating myself, uh, and because I don't want to bore the audience, but the, the thing that I am incredibly proud of is having created, been one of the creators along with select board members from uh, Sunderland and Deerfield, the South County Emergency Management Service. This is a service that reduced res average response times from 35 minutes to seven and a half minutes on average. It is a 24-7 paramedic level service, which is something that is unheard of in small towns. And because we work together, 
put our differences on the table, put our commonalities on the table, we figured out a way to make something happen that had never happened in the state before, create a regional ambulance service that delivered 24-7 paramedic level service. Another thing that I'm incredibly proud of is my work to solarize the towns of Williamsburg, Chesterfield, and Waitley. As a select board member back in 2013, I helped form the first regional solarized program in the state. Solarize was pretty young back then, and working together, we put over 100 roofs, uh, solar, solar installations on rooftops across the three towns, fighting climate change and generating jobs. And then quickly, the last thing is being the president of the Frontier Cal Ripken Youth Baseball League over the, over the past six years. I've worked passionately and hard for youth, youth in this region, and I do cry for, for, for where the, 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 the uh, organization goes because I put my heart and soul into it, and I am looking forward to finding uh, the next people to take over and do a better job than I did. But I'm incredibly proud of what I accomplished. Thank you. Kate. Um, so I uh, co-founded RuralOrganizing.org, which I'm very proud of since I just went to uh, New Orleans to attend the Netroots National Conference and was able to tell everybody about what's happening in Western Massachusetts. You know, there's incredible stories of um, people being intimidated and threatened in rural com communities across the country if they're dreamers, um, if they are indigenous, um, if they are black farmers, and um, I you know, conversely, there's also a lot that we can learn uh, and sort of question amongst ourselves about why we do lack diversity uh, in our district um, and what we can do in order to bring more diversity and be um, more of a refuge for people who um, want to have this rural way of life um, but are prevented from doing so in many parts around the country. Um, second, um, I already mentioned my state plan review law, which protected our town from uh, hopefully future Dollar Generals from coming in. Um, I have been part of um, the Gateway Hilltown um, marketing initiative. We got $40,000 to create an identity. Um, uh, Senator Heinz just got us $75,000 to open a visitor center. Um, and I believe it's the start of something that's really special happening down, uh, down south. And I hope that we can um, bring it up here as well, where we all connect um, our adorable towns together and show people from outside um, the tourist, the environmental possibilities. Um, also, I want to take credit for my husband on the school committee uh, getting all day pre-K uh, at Gateway Regional School, uh, where my son will be going uh, this year. Thank you. Natalie. So the first thing I'm, I'm really proud of is working alongside a number of you to, to identify transportation projects that are important. I have sat in a number of transportation planning organization meetings. I've developed transportation improvement plans. It's not very fun to sit at those meetings, but they're critically necessary for our small towns. And as a result of being involved in transportation, I worked behind the scenes for 10 years to bring rail service back to the Pioneer Valley to hit our major population centers of Greenfield and Northampton. And that took time, and it took, it took relationship building, and I was very thankful to be a part of that. Uh, I'm also very proud of my work to expand health care in our most rural areas. Uh, working for Congressman Olver, we were able to expand federally qualified community health centers, uh, and also to include dental service, where so many uh, were lacking dental service in our most rural areas. So as we're talking about universal single-payer health care coverage, which I absolutely support. We also need to be talking about access. If we have universal single-payer health care coverage, but we don't have anywhere for people to go, that's a problem. It's about that access, and I am very proud to have worked to expand that access. And finally, I'm very proud of my efforts locally on climate change. Uh, we were able to install geothermal wells at Greenfield Community College. We were able to build zero net energy affordable housing at Wisdom Way in Greenfield. We built one of the, I think, the first zero net energy transportation centers in the nation right here in the Pioneer Valley. I am proud of all of that work, and I'd like to continue that work on your behalf. Thank you. Christine. One of the biggest projects that I've taken on in the last few years is farming. When we took over the family farm, I was under the impression it would be charming to be a farmer, <laughs> and I quickly learned how difficult the work is. But I'm very proud to partake in producing healthy local food. And we, it, was, it was a struggle to start farming. We took over a family farm that for 30 years had had GMO corn on it. 
which was treated with glyphosate and atrazine. And that was quite a project for our farm transitioning to organic practices. And I've been helping other farmers in the area do the same. And we co-farm with some other local farmers to produce food. I'm also very proud that last summer I founded an advocacy group for divorced moms and their kids called First Families Advocacy Project. We were basically working against legislation that would be bad for elderly divorced moms and their kids in the Commonwealth. And the legislation was being brought by a group of people who had started in Florida and have been since working their way across the entire country. Um, and something else that was surprising to me when I, when I first came back six years ago was we got a knock on the door and a neighbor said, uh, we, we have this problem, we have a, a friend who's a veteran and he's having a problem with his insurance, can you do some of the legal work for him? So I did. And then the next week I got a call from a teacher who was having a problem with a union issue, so I helped her out. Uh, shortly after that, I helped a family with a probate issue. And I began to realize that there was a gap. So I created Hilltown Legal Services to help fill that need in our hill towns of helping people with small civil legal matters. Thank you. Our last question will be from the audience, and it, the order will be Christine, Nathaniel, and Jonathan. What is one topic you feel has been left out of the conversation in this race? Well, my topic and my answer are exactly the same. Me too. It has not been brought up in any of the forums. We haven't talked about it at all, and it's a major issue of our time. It is time that we believe the women and follow the children. That, that's where we are. Um, I, I'm the only candidate here who's worked in the State House before. I've worked for both a state representative and a governor. I had wonderful experiences in both places. But when I started working for the governor, I was harassed very badly by my supervisor. I was extremely lucky that the governor's legal counsel took me seriously when I went to her and told her what was happening. She helped immediately with her co-counsel, who was a very understanding and wonderful man. I got my position moved which at the time I thought was absolutely wonderful, and it worked out great because I got to work in the governor's legislative liaison office. And I got to learn a lot, and it was a lot of fun. But in hindsight, I realized how high the stakes are for women at work. It can be dangerous at work. It can be terrifying. You're not getting paid as much half the time. And then when you do complain, illegal behavior, sometimes you lose your job or lose your position. The person who was harassing me kept his position in his office, and I was the one who was moved, even though, by all, by all facts, I was the innocent party. So I'm glad that everybody's waking up to this, and I appreciate everyone's support, because it's only a very small percentage of people who are kind of ruining it for the rest of us, but Thank with support, you. we can pull it together. Thank you. Nathaniel. Thank you. Um, bottom line, if, if there's something that's important that hasn't been talked about, that I'm not doing a very good job up here, because uh, what I try to do is get up and talk about the things that nobody wants to talk about. Uh, but one of the big things that hasn't been talked about enough is um, the military. Um, part of that is because this is a state race. We don't have a lot of control over the military, so we don't really t talk about it because what are we going to do? Um, but the bottom line is more than half of the money that this country raises in taxes goes to the military. Um, none of these problems would be problems if we were doubling their budgets. If we got rid of the military entirely and doubled every social program's budget, we're done, go home now, have a good day. Um, so we're obviously not gonna completely limit the military budget, but one of the things we need to start talking about is, um, as I was saying before, our priorities. Uh, we shouldn't be having shortfalls in education when the B-2 bomber program or the, you know, the new fighter jet program is fully funded and not producing anything for us. Thank you very much. Jonathan. I actually think that there had been more conversations in, in this campaign about, about workforce about the lack of skills that exist to meet the 21st century jobs that we need to attract to this region. Jobs go where populations increase. Companies don't land where they don't believe there's the skilled workforce necessary for them to do their, their jobs. We need a more defined workforce development program across this region that trains people 
to fill the needed jobs or the, the jobs that exist in this region, the jobs that need to exist in this region. The growth sectors need a skilled workforce. And because we have a brain drain in this region, where college students and high school students are continuously leaving this area, we need to determine the best practices to keep them here. That only happens with a growing economy. That only happens when we train these students for the jobs that are going to make this, this economy run smoothly and grow and thrive and prosper. And right now, I go to Springfield on a daily basis to fill that skills gap with the people who have historically been left on the economic sidelines. But people across this region have historically been left on the economic sidelines. And skilling them up is the best way to keep them here and give them a, a sustainable career. Thank you. All right, we finished the questions and now we'll have our closing statements. Um, we'll begin with Natalie and then we'll be followed by Christine. So thank you League of Women Voters and the Recorder and FCAP for sponsoring this forum and for Deerfield for hosting us in this LEED certified building. And I wanna thank you for all of the voters for being here and coming out tonight. I've heard from so many of you on your doorsteps and in your driveways that this is a hard decision because there are so many progressive Democrats sitting here at this table. And what's happening in Washington, D.C. right now with this administration is directly impacting Massachusetts. And we have an opportunity. The Massachusetts Constitution, Article 7, and please just let me read this. Government is instituted for the common good, for the protection, safety, prosperity, and happiness of the people, and not for the profit, honor, or private interest of any one man, family, or class of men. Therefore, the people alone have an incontestable, unalienable, and indefeasible right to institute government, to reform, alter, or totally change the same when their protection, safety, prosperity, and happiness require it. That is our Massachusetts Constitution. We have an opportunity. We have an obligation to do what Massachusetts has always done, to lead this nation. And we can be a leader in the fight against climate change. We can institute universal single-payer health care coverage. We can ensure that everyone has access to local, healthy food. We can provide the very strongest safety nets for everyone in our community and those that need it most. I believe that one of the things that sets me apart in this race is my work across all government, local, state, and federal. I've already been working for you. And it is this deep understanding of the legislative process that will allow me to work alongside my colleagues to put in place the mechanisms that will uphold the principles that Massachusetts has always stood for. Our state legislators must raise their voices to protect these beliefs. And as your state legislator, I vow to you that I will raise our voices to ensure that they are heard in the halls of Beacon Hill. So thank you very much. I ask for your vote on September 4th. Thank you. Chris. Yeah. Thank you to our hosts, and thank you everyone for coming. These forums can be a labor of love, but our community really needs involved people like you. This was a tough week. Uh, my father and my stepfather-in-law was in the ER today, and it really reminded me of why Frank and I live here, so that we can be closer to our parents and our family, and not just for the free babysitting, I promise. Um, but helping our parents and my pro bono clients as they age has really impressed upon me how important it is that we have good services like healthcare access and transportation so that all of us can grow old in place. And when we started farming, we had a dream that someday we would pass our farm on to our kids. But we ask ourselves, what will it be like here in a few decades? Farming and producing food brings to the forefront environmental issues that need our immediate attention. And running two public interest legal groups that I founded to offer free legal services to the community makes me realize that there's a gap in services for veterans, seniors, transportation, consumer fraud, low income, and support for women and kids, to name a few. But most importantly, and the reason why I'm in this race, is because we're failing our kids on education. As I mentioned, my childhood school and my own children's school were closed, both due to funding issues. We need to address this 
on the state level. We need to get single-payer health care in place to also free up funds that we can redirect to education. Our schools need to be excellent, and we need to have good jobs and an exciting arts and culture environment so that our kids will want to stay here or be able to return and find good jobs. This campaign's been fun, but it hasn't been easy. I've been told I don't have the right shoes for the job. I've been told I don't look strong enough to be a farmer. I've been told I have no business on the campaign trail with two young kids at home. But as a lawyer committed to social justice and our constitutional rights, with years of training working on complicated, high-stakes negotiations and cases, and being the only candidate here who's worked in the State House before, Thank I have a unique you. set of skills to offer you. Vote for a doctor in the House. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I will we'll next hear from Kate, Nathaniel, and Jonathan. Uh, well, thank you so much to our hosts uh, for the opportunity to have this conversation tonight. I'm running for state representative because as the existential threats to our future grow larger, our politics has become smaller. We're still presented with a very narrow list of solutions that aren't solutions because they're designed to keep the status quo in place. The wealthy donors who fund our politicians make sure of that. I'm known as the journalist in the race, although I prefer the term muckraking journalist. It was coined by Teddy Roosevelt, who was exasperated by the investigative journalist who pushed him to create the reforms that would eventually become his legacy. Teddy Roosevelt would argue that the credit belongs to, quote, the man who is actually in the arena, and so I've taken Teddy up on the challenge. I have stepped away from journalism to enter the arena. It's time for us to launch a new progressive era by going on the offensive, by grabbing the bully pulpit and making sure that our voices speak louder than money. Look, they know that there is money to be made when we're not paying attention, but we've got a rare opportunity right now. Western Massachusetts can elect a brand new class of bold progressives. We can enter Boston as a united delegation to fight for single-payer health care, for a fully funded public education system, and for a real plan to reverse the threat of climate change. The new class of state representatives will also likely have an opportunity to choose a new House Speaker in the coming years. We have the power to shape this new era so that deep blue Massachusetts acts like it and closes the gap between what we want and what our politicians actually deliver. Wealthy interests have captured our legislature, but we can take it back. Look, I've served in the Clinton and Obama administrations, I've worked for J former President Jimmy Carter, and I'm the only candidate in this race who has been endorsed by a sitting Massachusetts state senator. I know how to navigate the corridors of power, but I also know how to call out the power brokers when they no longer work for the public interest. If you send me to Boston, I will harness our collective power in Western Massachusetts, our talent, our undervalued natural resources, and our stubborn resilience and ingenuity, and I will amplify our voices and make them listen. That's the secret of a muckraking journalist, and I hope you give me the opportunity to wield it on your behalf. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I want to talk about three different words tonight. Uh, the first one's representation. Um, representation really matters, and this is what the job is. This is not a executive branch. This is a representation. This is about being representative of the people. Uh, and if I look at the legislature in Massachusetts, what I see is a very white, very male, and very rich population. Um, the first two I can't do much about. I'm a white male, sorry. Um, but what really matters to me is that uh, the largest group of people who are unrepresented in the government are the working poor uh, and the, the extreme poor. Uh, the second word I want to, I've been thinking a lot about is experience. Um, as a lot of my candidates would love to tell you all about, they have a lot of experience doing lots of wonderful things. Um, but really, this is a job which has no requirements. This is not a job that you need a degree in something in. This is not a job that you need a pedigree. This is a job that you need to have morals, you need to be a good person, and you need to be someone who's willing to stand up and fight for the people who need that. Uh, and that's why I'm up here. Uh, and the third word I've been thinking a lot about is emboldened. Uh, I've spent a lot of my time recently fighting with racist trolls online, as I'm sure many of you have. Um, the, the ugly elements of our society have been emboldened over the last two years because of Donald Trump. Uh, people who have always been racist have been coming out of the woodwork and are feeling like they can now be racist in public. Uh, but on the other end of it is the emboldening, uh, the emboldenment of the left. Uh, I'm a democratic socialist, uh, and we are now seeing uh, democratic socialism actually being something that is talked about and is viable in this country. Uh, as we move forward, I see us shifting further to the left, uh, and that makes me very, very happy. So thank you very much for having me today, and uh, keep strong. Thank you. Jonathan. 
It's been a long campaign, and we have four weeks left from today. <laughs> and on the late nights you get home, and you think about who you met, and you think about the challenging conversations and the uplifting conversations and the ideas you had and the successes you talked about, the failures you, admit, failures you admitted. You sit there and you're tired and I, I know I've recently thought, what am I doing? When your kids miss you and your wife's running the house more than she usually, even more than she usually does. But then you start to reflect. I used to have a boss who I idolize. His name was Paul Songas. And he's been gone for, since 1997, 21 years. And Paul would always say on those tough days, this is a journey of purpose. It matters what you bring to the table as a candidate. And bringing something to the table means you're gonna have good days and bad days. But it's a journey of purpose. And so I thought, I need to reinvigorate this region with a new call to economic arms. And that's the way to further the progressive values that everyone on this table and everyone in this, in this audience believes in. A call to economic arms that takes advantage of job creation through clean energy. A call to economic arms that puts charging stations for electric vehicles in every town hall parking lot in the 19 towns of this district so we can create jobs and we can fight the generational immorality of climate change. These are the ideas and so many more that keep me and I'm sure all the people up on this stage going on a daily basis. It is a journey of purpose and I hope and I request that each of you consider your vote for me on September 4th and join me on this journey of purpose to make this region the greatest region to live, work, and play in Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you. And Casey, and we'll end with Francia. Thank you. And I want to thank the organizers for putting together this forum and really giving us the opportunity to speak directly to you. Um, my whole life, I've been working, advocating, and organizing for the first Franklin District, whether it was working with the Massachusetts Teachers Association on the Save Our Public Schools campaign, or the Mass Nurses Association and pushing for Medicare for All, and even locally in my community, serving on the broadband community and being a volunteer firefighter and emergency medical responder. To me, progressive isn't just a buzzword like it may be for other candidates. As a young person, <laughs> Progressive means being forward-thinking. As a community member, progressive means not only how can I help myself and my family, but how can I help thy neighbor? And progressive means being bold even when the establishment may not support it, like when it comes to Medicare for All, as an example. And it's not just jumping on a bandwagon when it becomes politically expedient. We need a state representative who's going to be visionary, not reactionary. And as I've gone through this campaign, I've done campaign work before, but man, it's different when you're the actual candidate. It's a lot. It's a lot. But as I spoke with so, sp spoken with so many people all across this district, it's become really clear to me, to my volunteers, to my staff, that it's time to elect the next generation of public servants, not politicians. Those who can bring that vision, bring that passion and that energy and inspire people to get involved in their community. And I only ask this, on Tuesday, September 4th, I encourage you to give peace a chance. Thank you very much. <laughs> and that's it. So Jonathan, my husband is right now knocking on doors um, for this campaign, and it's been a long campaign, which I'm very proud of. And this is a team effort, and um, this is not about me, it's about us, the First Franklin community. People often ask what policies set us apart from one another. As you have heard tonight, that might seem to be a difficult question to answer. You might be living with more questions. So please do listen to what we say but also I hope that you consider what our experience show you. My track record is clear. I walk my talk. 
I have always stood for public education professionally and personally. I am proud that my kids go to public schools and I was elected twice to a school committee to help improve our schools. I have always worked at the grassroots directly serving working people and families. I have been doing this work in the Pioneer Valley and in Massachusetts for 17 years. My family owns a small business, affectionately named the Boo, the Rendezvous restaurant, and we source food and beverage from local farms and pro producers. We also grow our own food at home and we use solar power. We live our values. I was a biology and chemistry teacher. I know that climate change is real and that it's necessary to fight it at every level. And also that this creates opportunities for our farms, food systems, solar and other industries in Massachusetts. I stood up for discrimination and racism against me and my family, against other people of color and minorities, immigrants, women, people living in poverty, and everybody else who's underrepresented. I will always speak truth to power, and I'm not afraid to stand up for what's right. I'm ready, and I will be proud to represent all people in the first Franklin district. I'm committed to continue sustaining and improving systems to better serve our community and the Commonwealth, and to treat all people with respect and dignity. So please, I hope to earn your vote by September 4th. Thank you. Let's give a big round of applause. <laughs> George from uh, The Recorder and Nicole from the League of Women Voters of Franklin <laughs> County. And to the audience for wanting to be informed and to vote yes. with information. That's wonderful and I hope you'll speak to your neighbors. There's also a, candid a candidates forum for the state senate race on August 13th right here in the Hess Auditorium. Um, and let's uh, say a special thanks to Deerfield Academy for hosting. Thank you. Good night.